Next item. Under finance budget report, administration will update the board on the budget. This item provides an opportunity for the board's information and discussion. Welcome, Susan Willis. We're glad to have you here. You have been one busy person lately. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um. Good afternoon, President Logan, Superintendent Thompson, members of the board. I'm Susan Willis, Chief Financial Officer, and we are going to give a very brief budget development report and fiscal year 20 year end update with just um, a couple key pieces of information to share with the board today. So just as a reminder of our budget timeline, as we are um, approaching the end of it, I'm, it has been um, a journey so far. We just have a few more months to go. Uh, today we close the fiscal year. Um, so uh, I sent staff an, an email when you uh, approved all the final budget reports on consent. Everyone was happy and they are now closing um, Oracle and beginning to um, roll the year in. So they were very happy. Um, we will, um, Expect to see state budget forms probably next week as um, KSD closes out their budget, um, their budget workshops. And we should have a first review to the board at the July 30th meeting. And then August 10th, we'll have the notice of hearing. And August 24th, we should um, be able to adopt a budget. And so we anticipate no interruption in that schedule at this point, And everything is looking good. Certainly, uh, we've covered this with the board um, during previous presentations in that there are um, some uncertainties impacting the budget, um, and we want to make sure that we have addressed um, as much as we can, um, giving the budget some flexibility as we go into fiscal year 21. But a few things have resolved um, here in the last week or so, and so we wanted to cover um, the highlighted um, items in red with the board today. Um, and we want to first start with the action the governor took last week on her fiscal year 21 allotment process. So the governor looked at that budgetary shortfall of $653 million, and she made various adjustments um, through the budget. Some of them were accounting type of transactions where she shifted some money into next year and she held some payments. Um, other items were, were a little bit more um, of a reduction to other parts of the budget. But for education, K-12 education, for the most part, we, um, we are not really harmed um, from a budgetary perspective. And so I think we certainly can look uh, at the governor's actions as very supportive of education, not only from our core mission of educating students, but certainly as a social net for communities and students. Um, there are a few things we want to point out that we are impacted by, um, and they are highlighted down below, and you can see in red the loss. Um, two pieces particularly where we are um, losing some funding. Uh, the state is not going to fund the Safe and Secure Schools grant for fiscal year 21. That was a matching grant. So we will not receive about $920,000. We would have had to reapply so that we don't know exactly what we would have received. But this year's amount was $920,000. So that was a match. So we can still continue to work on making our schools safe and secure. We've done a lot over the past two years with um, locks on inner doors, um, secured, uh, increasing the number of secured entrances, cameras. There's been a tremendous um, amount of work done in these past two years where we've had the matching grant. So we can still use our capital outlay for these purposes. We're just not going to receive the, the accompanying match. And then the other piece of um, funding we won't receive is the um, career and technical education transportation reimbursement. That's getting our students to um, CTE programs. That's about $50,000. We typically receive that in June, like we just received it last week. So we don't really do a lot with it other than it, it becomes a reimbursement and we typically carry that forward into next year. So again, all in all, less than a million dollar impact to us. Um, I think we can be very grateful at this point um, that we can move on with planning the budget. Um, certainly we're not out of the woods. A lot of uh, unknowns related to the pandemic continue. Um, we'll have to watch state revenues coming in these next few months. Certainly we'll look at um, how June revenues come in tomorrow. So I think we'll, we'll see a lot and we'll, we'll be able to kind of forecast if there will be some further action. But right now um, we are moving forward with no um, 
with no impact of significance to our um, budget for 21. The other piece of information we wanted to share with the board specifically since we had talked about it in May was one of the items we had um, looked at in our budget toolkit was our contingency reserve balance. And we had talked about the need to move that contingency reserve um, up um, for various reasons, but certainly um, the, the pandemic highlighted, as it had probably did for a lot of people, when you don't have enough in your bank account to cover emergency needs, it becomes very real very fast. And as we looked at the number of items, and you, you heard Dr. Irving talk about trying to plan for the different scenarios, and then you try to think through all the costs that need to go into planning for those scenarios, and you can see very quickly that not having enough reserves should things continue to impact us that we can't even anticipate today, that when we don't have enough reserves, we will find ourselves in some um, challenging times. It's like not having that three to six months of house payment or rent in your savings account. We needed to have some additional reserves to plan and, and, and potentially address those unexpected sh funding shortfalls or expenditures that, that right now we can't, we try to anticipate, but we, there may be other things coming at us we can't even dream about right now. So it's really that rainy day fund and trying to get those balances up. We had shared with the board, we were trying to reach a goal of somewhere total contingency reserve of between 25 and $30 million using unspent budget to bolster that particular um, uh, cash fund. And again, we had shared with the board that nationally, compared to our Council of Great City School counterparts, we were very low with um, a fund balance of, a, of less than 3% compared to the median of 9% across the board for council schools. And then statewide, which looks at cash balances in a slightly different way, we were sitting very low there too at about 8.64% compared to the median across the state of closer to 15%. So that was our goal. How did we do? Um, we, did, we did well. Um, our contingency reserve balance at June 3019 was 14,873,000 and change, and we were able to put $11.8 million into contingency to end the fiscal year at a, a contingency reserve balance of $26,719,964. So just a little bit above the low end of our goal, not quite to the 30 million, but I still feel very, very positive that we accomplished what we wanted to accomplish by putting the district in a much better financial position um, for those truly unexpected emergency type situations it isn't probably quite where we need to be. So at some point when we kind of get past pandemic issues, we might wanna have a conversation about setting a goal in contingency reserve closer to what we probably should be, which is about a month's worth of operating expenditures. That would put us closer to a $50 million contingency reserve. But for right now, we can cover a teacher payroll. We, we can cover 10, about 10 days of operating expenditures. Um, we are in a much better place than we were, um, well, yesterday. So um, I feel, I've, I, I hope the board can sleep a little bit better with that um, at night. I know I feel a lot better about where we're at. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to share that we are working on, um, and we, and Dr. Irving referenced the um, technology purchase that the board approved. Um, we probably do need to clarify, we purchased the technology. We have not purchased the internet access yet. That is, that, that's an area we are working on. Um, and the early costs, so we, we are still working on all sorts of options and what sort of coverage we're going to get and how many years of plans do we want to try to uh, look at. So lots of moving parts on this issue right now. But an early estimated, an estimated cost, if we were to provide internet for the, our free and reduced students, that would be about $6 million a year. Um, we are looking at funding sources on various fronts. The first thing we did was we completed a needs assessment with Sedgwick County. They are getting CARES money at the county level. Um, they need to spend it 
um, by the end of the calendar year. So this falls right into line with some of their allow allowances within their CARES allocation. So we are trying to get um, portions of that for our district, and we have started that process, and we are now waiting kind of for step two. Um, we are also working with a coalition of community and government agencies, including the Greater Wichita Partnership, the City of Wichita, Cedric County, Wichita Regional Chamber of Commerce, Wichita State University, WSU Tech, Regional Economic Area Partnership, or REAP, um, and the Workforce Alliance of South Central Kansas to pursue funding for connectivity um, through states, the state's federal funding um, that's kind of overseen by the SPARC Task Force. So that is another funding stream that we have, um, we might have uh, availability to, to tap into for this purpose. And all of these groups have kind of agreed and, and have consensus around that connectivity for our students is, and families is a critical component um, as we go through whatever next stages of the pandemic the community um, might have. And I just want to just stop here for a minute just to kind of elaborate just a little bit because, you know, we just think about our own little lane about education and needing connectivity so the kids can learn. But just think of all of the opportunities that families, not just students, but families could take advantage of to better their uh, conditions if they had connectivity uh, to internet access. So when this group began to meet and we were invited to, to uh, participate, it was just interesting to hear all of the avenues in which people miss out on uh, because of the lack of connectivity uh, for that and then to even have a device. So I think it, now this is another perfect example of our community, the D Wichita community, rallying together as a group to say, we have some needs in our community and as a unit we're gonna put all of our resources together to be able and work together to be able to solve a community uh, issue. So I wanna just stop here just to give a kudos to all of these folks. If they're listening, if not there, somebody else is listening, somebody could tell them we gave them some kudos because I just think that that, is, that just goes to what it means to live in Wichita, Kansas with a group of people who want what's best for all community members. I agree. There was a lot of energy and excitement around this particular topic. I believe that the, the group um, fully supports um, th that community need for this particular, um, which is almost becoming more like a utility, um, this, this need for connectivity for families. So it was a very refreshing um, conversation to have so many people basically in, in having consensus around a very important topic, and hopefully we, we see some rewards. Um, we also have been watching some bills at the federal level that would also address connectivity for high needs populations. So um, there are several options that, that we are looking at, and we are also um, working on our priorities within our own capital outlay allocation. So I, I don't have um, concerns at this point that we can't financially do this for a year. For sure, sustainability is is a, certainly a concern that we will need to kind of look forward past just fiscal year 21 and how do we maintain for fiscal year 22 and beyond, even after we do make it out of the pandemic um, situation, because certainly that's going to be an important transition. Um, this hybrid learning may not go away, so we want to be able to serve the needs of those students with connectivity. So those are just items that we are still kind of trying to embed in the budget, and we'll be able to report back to you on that, hopefully, um, towards the end of the month. Next month, July. So again, we just wanted to take a few minutes today to kind of point out those key budget takeaways. Um, and again, that the, the first allotments from the governor left K-12 education largely intact, except for the Safe and Secure Schools grant and CTE transportation reimbursement. The total impact to our budget will be less than a million dollars. Um, and then through futility, fuel, and other unspent budget during the shutdown, and with the efforts of the entire district, certainly this was a uh, collaborative district-wide effort um, to tighten spending while plans are being made for uh, what the 2021 school year looks like. We were able to um, uh, put $11.9 million into our contingency reserve to give us a balance of $26.7 million for fiscal year 21, and that we are exploring those options for connectivity, and hopefully we'll have that um, embedded in the 21 budget, and we'll be ready to move right forward into the next school year. And then with that, we will take any questions you have. 
Ernestine? Well, this is way back on your first slide, and I just want, I noticed that something un, that was not funded was something that I didn't know what it was. Juvenile Transition Crisis Program. So that's a program that is at the state level. We don't receive any money for that. So we weren't impacted um, through that particular reduction. So we're, it's about $300,000. I don't believe it's been actually spent out of the budget for several years now. Okay. So I don't see, I don't believe there's any impact even to other groups, but certainly it wasn't an impact to us. I just hadn't ever heard of it. And I, okay. I hadn't either. I had to ask about it myself. Okay. Ben? Yes, Ben Blankley, District 1. I know uh, pre-pandemic, um, a lot of our priorities and capital outlay were set up to tackle the mountain of deferred maintenance that we have across all our buildings. Um, and so is the expectation now that that is essentially going to shift more towards, because the capital outlay is fungible, within technology and building maintenance type items. Um, is that the expectation now? Uh, Susan Willis, um, CFO. So the, the, I, we will not give up on the deferred maintenance activities for sure. Um, we, what we will be looking at is the allocations we currently give to um, information technology and certainly through the lease, and, and us being able to kind of get all this equipment kind of all at one time, that should free up some of their current allocation to be used for this purpose. And then we have had some set asides um, that we keep for reserves that we should be able to use within capital outlay to help hopefully all of those things in conjunction with some of these other funds, we're gonna get there with hopefully without impacting the deferred maintenance schedule. The um, the other pieces that are happening within um, that information technology budget, as um, as Mr. Dixon has kind of really transitioned everything that we're doing, um, we are starting to kind of carve out pieces of unnecessary um, services. So we have, while he kind of consolidates and gets us kind of moving forward, we are able to kind of have some savings in some of his budget lines that we are then able to use for this purpose. So kind of a lot of moving pieces in that capital outlay budget. We might have to pull back a little bit on um, some of our safety pieces. Um, f if, we, if we don't get some of these other funding pieces that we're looking at, but I don't foresee it to be a big impact at this point. Okay, thank you. I just have a, Cheryl Logan uh, at large. I have a question about the, you had the, the first slide with three items that you addressed that were in red, but the item right below that is the declining enrollment and the impact of the pandemic as you're building the new budget. Um, I know that our enrollment's been going down for the last couple of three years, and it is, the rule with the state is we take uh, this year's if it's the most or how, what's the, sure. how do we figure that, sure. I guess, is the question. Uh, Susan Willis, CFO. So our fiscal year 21 budget will be built on fiscal year 19's enrollment because that's the higher of the previous two years. Okay. So it looks at enrollment at 9-20-18 or 9-20-19, and you compare those two, and whichever is higher, you get that. So we're kind of in a two-year lag. As we've continued to decline, we're actually able to hop back two years to a higher number, and we're able to build a budget on that number. So obviously the concern we have for fiscal year 22 is the, this past year's enrollment really took about a 600 FTE slide down. So that's a, that's a pretty good number we're gonna have to try to overcome in next year's budget. Um, certainly there's, there's hopefully some, um, if we have some additional revenues in say at risk because of you know, changes in the poverty level, there might be some additional funding a little bit made up there. But again, that's that's why we're trying to build in some of this like contingency reserve items now, because next year, when we look at ahead, we know that it, things are gonna be a little bit tighter because of that declining enrollment. We're, we're, and then two, we don't know what enrollment exactly is going to look like or what the count method exactly is going to look like for 920 this year all sorts of possibilities exist. As, as Dr. Thompson said earlier, we're, 
We're waiting on definitive final guidance from KSDE on what we will need to do on 920. Um, but it will be that accountability right now will still have to be baked in to the budgeting process. So at this point, we, whatever the method is, that count process is still critical to us to make sure that our students are counted in whatever fashion we need them counted on 920. So that is work that we will need to look at as far as how do we make sure that whatever method that is, that every student is accounted for on that date. Because it is possible our enrollment could go up a little bit this year if we didn't lose kids because of the counting process. It's, it's very possible, especially as we've, you know, as we've enhanced our um, Imagine Academy, as we've done um, a whole slew of things to get ready for students coming back. And certainly there's some economic issues that might impact families who decided to stay in our community. Um, we could have an enrollment bump. So I think, again, being the very unique situation we're in, it's very hard to forecast. Um, you know, when we were asked that at the budget workshop, we're like, well, <laughs> there's no historical precedent to look back at. So we're just going to try to you know, do our best guess as far as what we think is going to happen and we'll see how the numbers uh, shake out very good thank you and i'm julie did you have any questions for uh susan no questions thank you okay i think that's it then thank, thank you very thank much you. for your presentation